These are my mountains, these are my fells. Tucked up in the northwest corner of England, a magical land of water and rock, soaring ridges and deeply rooted dales. Fashioned by nature, clothed by man, adored by each new generation for its heritage and harmony. It's my vision of heaven on earth. Welcome to Lakeland and the mountains I love. I'm Mark Richards and I'm going to be leading you from the very eastern edge of the Lake District National Park right into its mountain heart. For me, it's hard to believe, but it's half a century since I was first enslaved by the beauty of the English Lake District, then only a decade after the National Park was established. As a youngster, I'd heard of the lakes. I'd seen it in books. In my mind's eye, I held a romantic vision. But it was only with the discovery of Great Langdale, at the age of 12, during a day trip from the Yorkshire Dales, that my sense of its majestic beauty was truly instilled. The years have passed. I'm as passionate as ever about this mountain world. It's a flame that never dims. Hugely influenced by the six year period from 1971, when I walked with Alfred Wainwright. Looking over his shoulder and seeing firsthand how he crafted his inspirational guides. With A.W. as my teacher and mentor, it's no wonder the creation of practical guides have become an intrinsic part of my life too, culminating in the eight-part Lakeland Fell Ranger series. And now talking walking. The Westmoreland Highway is, in essence, the complete adventure on the high fells. A three-day inward trek culminating with a further two to three days climbing above Great Langdale. It's a feel-good walking holiday, something we all need from time to time to recharge our batteries and to know that the world about us is good too. The three-day approach links ten delectable dales, each a magical quest in its own right, drawing you ever nearer the heart of the park. Like the trek from Kathmandu to Everest Base Camp, our destiny a fabulous mountain sanctuary. Encircled by such enigmatic heights as Pika Blisco, Crinkled Crags, Bowfell and the Langdale Pikes. It's the ultimate high divide and the westernmost limit of the old county of Westmoreland. Since 1970, the M6 has been the primary access for the vast majority of visitors to the lakes. So what fortune that the finest fells can be reached from the finest motorway services in Britain. The Westmoreland services at T-Bay. Well, here I stand at the cusp of discovery. But why this spot? With the incessant noise of traffic streaming along the motorway through the trees, and over to my right, a melee of lorries, coaches, cars and people, all entering the northbound services. And above my head, raucous rooks in their age-old colony, high in the Scots pine trees. Well, truth be told, these trees are rooted in history. This fence line follows the line of a faint hollowway of a Roman road, with a timeline stretching back nearly 2,000 years. Clearly, this place has been the centre of trade and travel, back into the mists of time. Well, it may seem perverse to begin a great outdoor adventure by venturing indoors, but you may wish to stock up for your first day on the highway with a ready-to-go snack sold in the fabulous farm shop, a unique facility in any motorway services. So when seated, contemplating the wide panoramic outlook towards the fells and the start of your walk, you can honestly say you're eating the view. Truly, this is slow food in the fast lane. We begin from the northbound services by the Westmoreland Hotel, stepping out onto the Orton Road. 
Well, I'm turning my back on the motorway and heading west to the promised land. <laughs> well, not exactly, but it's the first tantalizing glimpse we get of Breatherdale, the opening chapter of our Westmoreland Highway adventure. At first glance, the outlook may not look like the Lakeland you know and love. Indeed, there's a distinct Pennine feel abroad. Initial perceptions transformed as you become engrossed in the prism of the walk. This is Scotsman's Bridge, the country lane squeezing over the West Coast main line. In its time, a popular spot for train enthusiasts to stand with cameras poised to capture the flying Scotsman in full steam. The snaking track and cutting adding to the drama of a locomotive that first graced the rails in 1862. What an amazing transition. In an instant, the motorway is lost and all but forgotten, as we glance over the bridge at this lovely aspect of Birkbeck. Green home means the lush meadow, and the hamlet retains an air of quiet contentment. We head up the track from the community hall by Low Wynn Howe. 60 years ago, the Lake District National Park's boundary was determined by the A6 over Shap Fell, thereby excluding the Borrowdale and Breatherdale Fells. We're now moving closer to an eastward realignment that may fix the boundary on the M6, with the Orton Fells and the entire Howgill Massif set to be drawn into the neighbouring Dales National Park, bringing these two precious landscapes into one visual and harmonious whole. Low Wynn Howe Farmstead has certainly known better days. A set of old haymaking implements, a reminder of the time before silage when farmers struggled with the unpredictable weather to capture a decent cut of hay. Behind me you can see the Westmoreland services, backed by the Orton Fells and the Pennines of Nine Standards Rig and Malastang Edge. And over here the Howgills and the Winash Ridge. And wow, Breatherdale! What a surprise, and I have to say, enchantingly beautiful. And to all intents unknown, despite its proximity to the motorway. A delectable greenway promenades at mid-height along the northern flank of the dale, giving the most intimate view of this serene valley. Over there you can see the Brest High Road heading southwest, making its way out of the valley towards the saddle on the Winash Ridge and then over into Borrowdale. Under the bower of sycamores, a cobbled fort of Breatherdale Beck and a delicately poised footbridge. Oh, dare I walk over? Solid as a rock. That must be the balancing limit of a stone beam clamper bridge. This is Bridge End Farm. Clearly its farming life has ebbed away. In its place, a poignant air of suspended animation. Bidding farewell to Breatherdale, we head for the next valley. 
the Brest High Road is open to all traffic for fun off-roaders giving the stony track a hard time. Fortunately, walkers can step to one side at its worst and make good progress onto the ridge. One last look back to the now distant motorway and thoughts turn to the second great valley of our trek. Well, I've just completed my first climb of the day, crossing the Winash Ridge, and above me the Skylarks are singing, and below me Westmoreland Borrowdale, every inch a Lakeland Valley, only fleetingly seen from the A6 down there, but seen to perfection from up here, with Ashdead Fell and Mabbing Crag across the valley. Absolutely gorgeous. This little stone is known as the Thunderstone. It's a local term for a sharp pink granite erratic, transported by ice 14,000 years ago and dumped at this spot, having been conveyed probably three miles to get here. Down the valley, you can see High Borrowdale Farm, that little clump of trees down there. It's a grand little view, isn't it? This spot is synonymous with the Leyland Clock, which stood here for 40 years until the arrival of the M6. Travellers were never quite certain whether it was telling the right time, but it was a wonderful cue for the view down Westmoreland Borrowdale. There is a story of a travelling circus that had to negotiate the steep climb up to Shap Summit on the A6 behind me. It was quite a difficult climb and the elephants had to walk. Well, it was a trunk road, wasn't it? <laughs> There are only two farms down Dale towards the Loon Gorge, one active, Low Borrowdale, though even there the farmer commutes from T-Bay, and High Borrowdale, owned and cared for by the Friends of the Lake District. Appropriately screened by Leylandi, after the Leyland clock, Kendall Caravan stands on the site of the former Jungle Cafe, which until the arrival of the M6 was a popular rendezvous for trucks. But the day after the M6 opened in 1970, takings here plummeted to a paltry six pounds. The highway follows the original Shap Road, a lovely green trail cutting across the foot of secretive Bannersdale. Although the Dale name meant the Cursed Valley, some may say it blessed. Kendall Museum holds a purse mislaid on this old road by a Highlander during the hasty Jacobite retreat of 1745. Coming down by Plough Farm, now a country byway, the highway duly reconnects with the A6 at Watchgate. Travellers on the A6 get a tantalising glimpse up into a long sleddle. It's like looking at forbidden fruit, a distant promise of wild, romantic mountains. Well, this charming little spot is Garnet Bridge, and I have to say it is beautiful on a day like today. This little bridge spans the River Sprint, a powerful little body of water that in Victorian times powered lanes in two bobbin mills, taking advantage of a sweet chestnut grove that was planted above the hamlet and is the only sweet chestnut grove in the whole of Cumbria.
a lovely green lane leads invitingly on from Garnet Bridge, a branching nature trail giving access to that enchanted shady grove. The age-old practice of hedge laying can in time induce curious effects, as here, this long lateral trunk grew amid a dense thicket that didn't survive the persistent nibbling of sheep. An open farm track draws the happy wanderer into a charming world of skipping lambs, a rural stroll from another age. These trackside slabs, quaintly known as the Roman stones, once lined the base of a dense hedge, stopping sheep from sneaking through, though they're clearly not that old. From Tenter Howe one gets the most compelling view of Longsleddle, its pastures, its woods, its high fell brows. But for the Dalehead Mountains, one might be in some idyllic Yorkshire Dale. Half a century of neglect showing in the old farmstead at its base. A tenter was a frame for stretching woolen cloth. However, the highway doesn't keep you on tenter hooks, as the valley track draws us invitingly on towards the upper dale, through Herbridge Meadows ablaze with golden buttercups. Long Sleddle is closely associated with the rough fell sheep. Its fleece, the basis of Kendall carpet manufacture since the early 19th century. Indeed, the oldest house in the valley, Yew Barrow, actually meant mountain sheep pasture. The Peel Tower, incorporated in the farmhouse, was built in the mid 15th century. The present owners devoting themselves to an authentic restoration some 10 years ago. It's now the home of the Cumberland and Westmoreland Sausage Company. My wonderful green trail up Long Sleddle ends enigmatically as I step onto the road at Whirl Howe. This moraine has certain Mother Earth-like qualities, don't you feel? Excavations have proved inconclusive, so it's probably not a tumulus. It's got a ragged barnet of broom. This 19th century lime kiln pinpoints a narrow band of Coniston limestone here in Stockdale. The burnt lime liberally spread by hand, invigorated pasture growth for grazing and hay. The outdoor centre is a brilliantly conceived bunkhouse facility for groups, in kilter with the adventurous nature of this setting. Well, after 14 miles of immensely pleasurable walking, I end my first day on the Westmoreland Highway here at Sadgill, at the meeting place of ancient packhorse ways at the threshold of Mountain Lakeland. Goat scar behind me says it all, don't you feel? Earliest references give the crags as the Wild Boar Cove, though feral goats were encouraged to live on Lakeland crags to discourage sheep by eating the ledges bare. The hamlet of Sadgill remains wedded to sheep farming. Indeed, the name meant the ravine of the shepherd's summer home. Fell walkers congregate here, setting their sights on the great ridges above leading to Harter Fell, with its grand view down on Horsewater and across to the wild coves of the High Street Range. Our second day brings three climbs and three amazing valleys, ultimately cresting once fell pike we scamper down into Ambleside.
Wow, day two of the walk has got off to a cracking start as I come across the Style End Pass. And I've got one of these hold the breath moments. Upper Kentmere is eye catchingly beautiful. You can tell how the Ilbell range will have influenced the imagery of the Postman Pat television series. This dale head was the daily inspiration for Alfred Wainwright from his home in Kendall Green, a perspective I hold dear to, having observed it from his upstairs study window on many occasions. The River Kent, from which the town name Kendall derives, has its birth in this gorgeous valley. The skyline ridge walk encircling the Dale Head and including the summit of High Street crosses Nanbeal to Harterfell and Kentmere Pike, makes a brilliant fell day. But for now my intentions lie elsewhere, as I cast my eye across the valley for Garbon Pass. The parish of Kentmere is divided into four quarters, Common, Crag, Green and Hallow Bank, where we join the High Lane and turn down towards the village, with the Ilbell Range the captivating focus of Crag Quarter. St Cuthbert stands steadfast overlooking the Lower Dale. Here's the grave of Henry Marshall, who first saw the worth in Alfred Wainwright's genius. Sad that to his dying day he felt his vision, time and investment in giving life to the first six titles in the pictorial guides, now a national institution, was never properly acknowledged. And here at the edge of St Cuthbert's graveyard, in amongst the wild flowers, the grave of Edith and Henry Marshall of Lowbridge, and heaping up the anguish their son Roger, who died tragically on Everest in 1987. Clearly a family who had a great passion for their mountains. Well, we've had a really good walk already, and you can see St Cuthbert's Church with green quarter above it. And I'm looking over the wall at the Brockstone, a massive boulder, or as signs show you as you approach it, Badger Rock. The white marks are the handholds of bouldering climbers. And down in the Vale, you can just see the blue sky reflected in Kentmere. And I can just see down to my right the castellated tower of Kentmere Hall from a time when farming and fear went hand in glove. The highway now embarks on its first real test, cresting the Garbon Pass at 1,467 feet. Don't you just love Lakeland? One minute, gorgeous sunshine. Next minute, the clouds roll in. However, you just can't beat it. I'm just pausing here to reflect on the rather interesting geology. You'll notice in the background great outcrops of volcanic rock. These were intruded into the softer and more ancient Silurian rocks that's run to the south towards Windermere. And the old drove road that we're on, the Garbon Pass Road, corresponds with the Style End Road, which follows the line of a weakness created by the Coniston limestones. And you'll remember the lime kiln at Stockdale at Head of Long Sleddle. So it makes an interesting line for our journey, and we're heading up now to the top of the Garbon Pass. From here, we gain our first view of Shangri-La. Westward, beyond the near horizon of Wansfell, see the great mountains that form the roof of England. Centre stage, the majestic fells at the head of Great Langdale, backed by the Score Fells.
The Garbon Road brings us down into the Troutbeck Valley by Applethwaite Quarry, source of considerable quantities of the local building stone. Perhaps no village in Lakeland better shows off its farming heritage than Troutbeck, a mile-long linear community with a string of authentic yeoman steadings lining the fellside. Near the foot of the Garbon Road, spot this private notice, being consumed by the bark of a tree. We cross Troutbeck to pass St. Jesus' Church, elegantly constructed from Applethwaite Slate. It's only one of two churches in England with this dedication. Now turn up through the Dale pastures and buy contented sheep to reach this much admired village. The post office is a fine place to pause and enjoy a cuppa with Henrietta for company. And then there's Town End, a particularly special vernacular farmstead. This house has personality. To my mind, no other house in Lakeland better evokes that sense of durable elegance. Now in the care of the National Trust, yet for over 400 years in one family, a working farm. Even to this day, the adjacent bank barn functions as it did for all those years. It's a wonderful place to visit. Having climbed Annie Lane, the walk bursts upon the summit of Wandsfell Pike. Feast your eyes, all the romance of Lakeland, its fells, its lakes, its woods, and the delightful interplay of it all. And behind me, the entire length of Lake Windermere. And before me in the vale below, Ambleside, the end of day two, and beyond that, the fells of our noble ambition. We may pause to consider Ambleside before taking the newly pitched path heading smartly downhill. The steep descent is quickly done, joining the roadway and path into Stockgill Park, where we find Stockgill Force. Even in summer, this can be quite a thunderous sight. Day three, and we leave Ambleside with mounting anticipation venture through Sylvan Valleys via Little Langdale to climb Lingmore Fell. The placid waters of Windermere at Waterhead, an early morning reflective delight. How instinctively gregarious we are. Even a lone fell wanderer such as I gravitate just occasionally to such places as Ambleside. Inevitably tourism spawned the towns of Windermere, Keswick and Ambleside, creating centres of trade, travel and cosy accommodation. 
how useful regular bus services that enable visitors to connect easily along the main valleys. A triple five service running between Windermere and Keswick conveniently stops here, as to the Coniston and Langdale Rambler buses. As its name suggests, the Langdale Rambler is really useful to our venture. In the summer season, running to and fro from the old Dungeon Gill. Strolling by the spire of St Mary's, we pass the community hall, proof that modern architecture can respond to the landscape. Its slate walls seem to grow from the living rock. Passing serenely through Rorthy Park, we cross Miller Bridge and begin the little climb onto the open fell of Todd Crag. Seldom in Lakeland are we served up with views of quite the calibre of Todd Crag and at so modest an elevation. Behind me to the west are the majestic fells of Great Langdale, where we're heading. Tremendous anticipation on that front. But for the present, I think most visitors will get greatest satisfaction from looking down at the outflow of the River Rorthy into the lake and seeing at Waterhead the site of the Roman fort of Galava. Gaze back over Ambleside to reflect on the recent journey from Wansfell Pike and absorb the long view down Windermere. A lovely ridge draws you on by Lily Tarn, a lone birch tree, a focus on a tiny isle. The Fix the Fells project works at many levels, securing paths and making them fit for purpose. As for instance here, where the bridleway running down by Ivy Crag has been inverted, the subsoil making a lovely durable trail. The highway comes down by Luffrig Tarn, a hidden gem, providing a pleasing view of the Langdale Pikes. Then meets the road at Skelwith Bridge. At this point, joining forces with the Cumbria Way, heading for Colwith Bridge and Little Langdale. Perhaps pausing, as I did with my film crew, for a well-earned ice cream in the garden of Elterwater Park. I just had to step aside from the route for just a moment to visit a favourite little spot of mine, Slater Bridge, spanning Little Langdale Beck. It's a beautiful little spot, a combination of Clapper Bridge and Rustic Arch, simple, functional, practical, but exquisitely beautiful. I sense the Slaters who built this were aware they were creating something of supreme beauty. They love their stone, hard won from the quarries close by. 
Here lurks the mighty cathedral cavern, a short tunnel leading into a massive chamber. Journeying on by low and high Hallgarth, the graceful slopes of Lingmore Fell are soon in view, very much at the heart of the Langdale Valleys. The Langdale Pikes tantalisingly appear through the gap in the fells. We can wait no longer. The slate string course on Bridge End, the perfect rock garden for Sedum. The National Trust, owners of Fellfoot Farm, set up this discreet board to identify the Ting Man. Early Viking settlers brought their own brand of governance to these wild mountains, holding important open air meetings here at this moot point and it may have been in use for several hundred years until monastic authority took over administration of rural affairs. We pass up by the fortress-like Castle Howe, upon what originally had been the Roman road to Ravenglass. Proceeding across the fell side under Blake Rig, drama is brewing with every stride. The Langdale Pikes becoming the most compelling mountain composition, fit for a canvas. Well, here we are at the threshold of Great Langdale, beside the exquisitely beautiful Blee Tarn. And at this point, we have a choice. We can follow the regular path, which goes over the pass and down to the Langdale campsite and the old Dungeon Gill Hotel. But my choice today is to climb Lingmore Fell and get the classic view of the head of Great Langdale. Well, in fact, the clouds prevented me from going any further, so I started the ascent the following day. As I climb, the mountains seem to grow, with crinkled crags and bow fell and the enigmatic Langdale pikes beautifully dappled by cloud shadow, captivating attention. The conifers that shade Blee Tarn are far from out of place, lending an almost alpine aspect to the peat-darkened waters. Yet more larches crowd in at the head of the ravine, framing our view of Bowfell, as well as Wetherlam, Swirl Howe, and the Pikes, a beautiful composition. Exposed to the fiercest winds, the larches inevitably tumble in this spot, and like the views which rise and rise, like this hawk above my head. Enveloped in heather and rock, Brown Howe, the top of Willingmore Fell, has the most riveting view of the curving line of Great Langdale, centred upon chapel style. On the horizon, Helvellyn, Fairfield, then round by the Kentmere Fells to Windermere and the far-off Howgills. It's a place gifted for lingering reflection. On any half-decent day, you'll witness a steady flow of walkers who know and love this fell for its exceptional scenic qualities.
The view from the ridge wall is pure mountain magic. At once you see the two components of this great dale head. The Langdale Pikes and centre stage Bowfell. With Pika Blisco and Crinkle Crags, it's crowning glory. Wow, look at the Langdale Pikes. Aren't they majestic mountains? But just think of them in volcanic terms. Great spewing vents of molten lava. The volcanicity there is amazing. Back by the Coniston Fells, the sun-dappled Bleetarn looks so tiny from this vantage. Then continuing down by the ridge wall, the great lure being the craggy headland of Side Pike, with its testing lateral passage, unlocked through this tight rock cleft. Ah, oh, neat. One size fits all. Or nearly so, anyway. Well, that's rather nice. Well, I got through there all right. Day four, and the pikes cannot be resisted as we climb above Dungeon Gill, claiming the summit's round to Stickle Tarn. Walkers on the band get a grandstand view of the opening leg of our day, focused on Gimmer Crag and Piker Stickle, with a scree spilling from the South Gully, a striking tassel of fractured rock. The Mark Gate path gives perhaps the best line of approach onto the Pikes Massif. It forms the main climber's approach to Gimmer Crag and is the primary way for fell walkers, bent on Loft Crag and Piker Stickle. Dungeon Gill is normally quite modest. However, its ravine is anything but. The no-go dungeon is hidden below this point. But this mid-height mare's tail waterfall is an indication of the excitements that lurk in its wild upper canyon. See the Langdale campsite and the Serpentine Trail descending to the old Dungeon Gill, the final stretch of our highway approach. Higher up the Mark Gate reveals enthralling views down Great Langdale beyond the new Dungeon Gill. Scanning west, the headwall of Mickledean draws attention to Bowfell's craggy crown. An enticing aside, the climber's traverse gives a grand gallery view of Gimmer Crag. Witness climbers engaged in their amazing sport. Created from the plug of a volcano, active some 460 million years ago, when this piece of the Earth's crust actually lay south of the Tropic of Capricorn, proof that even eternal hills move. Wow, and just finishing the ascent from the new Dungeon Gill on the appropriately named Mark Gate to arrive here at Loft Crag. What a fantastic spot on a day like today. In the background, Crinkle Crags, Bowfell, and Piker Stickle. What an amazing knuckle of rock it is.
Another thrilling moment. From here at the top of South Gully, I'm looking right down into the depths of Mickledean. Over recent decades, scree runners have ruined this gully. It's simply too dangerous to go down to inspect the shallow cave on the right-hand side, the primary source of the famous Langdale stone axes. These high-status items, polished in axe factories in the Dale Bottom, were traded widely in Neolithic Britain. They were so treasured that although many have been found, they are invariably in pristine condition. Don't you just love the casual way sheep perch themselves on rocks, nonchalantly observing the passing Homo sapiens? A camel train of walkers forges its way up a pitched path. Even solitary wanderers, such as myself, first learnt the thrill of high places in such a company. Arriving on Harrison's Tickle, find the perfect angle to judge Pavey Arc, a huge buttress of volcanic rock, with Stickle Tarn cradled in the hanging valley below. Scanning the eastern horizon, Fairfield, and St Sunday Crag above Seat Sandal, and a lovely bird's eye view down upon the Great Langdale Meadows. Peering along the northern skyline, the Solway Firth above the high plateau of Thunica Knot. The wider view from high rays via Skidder, round by Clara Mara and Great Gable is exceptional. The Coniston group forms a fine southern horizon, from Weatherlam round by Coniston Old Man and Squirrel Howe, as to Crinkle Crags and Bowfell. The upper canyon of Dungeon Gill is out of bounds for the walker but can be studied from the path running under the southern craggy facade of Harrison Stickle. The shores of Stickle Tarn are a place of abiding pleasure for the lover of wild mountain settings, with Paviark a tremendous, seemingly unassailable backdrop. But walkers can be spotted carefully working their way up Jack's Rake, a rock ladder in the midst of the stirring architecture of the cliff. We turn down the quiet fell side, entering Millgill lower down. Pike Howe and Side Pike, notable landmarks en route. Day five and we stride south to claim the impressive summit of Pike Oblisco. Through the 1950s, the old Dungeon Gill Hotel was an important meeting place for mountaineers. Sid Cross, the landlord, really cared for his climbing clientele. He was instrumental in organising the first search and rescue volunteers, forerunner of the modern and vital Langdale Mountain Rescue Team. Coming up to the open hairpins, I step onto the Red Acre Path, Back by Mickledean, a classic U-shaped valley, gouged by a huge Ice Age glacier, with Bowfell and Crinkle Crags, a captivating backdrop. Early in the ascent, glancing back down onto the old Dungeon Gill. 
Not only a grand all-round viewpoint, but the furthest south top cairn was a county boundary marker between Lancashire and Westmoreland, being the peak point rising from the Three Shires stone on Rhinos Pass. The prime place to stand is here on the north top, from where you can not only reflect on your most recent adventures on the Langdale Pikes and Lowly Lingmore, but from this rocky crest of Pika Blisco, I can judge the great mountain day that is our finale. Crinkle Crags and Bowfell. I remember when I first met Wainwright, he was in the middle of drawing this very view for his fourth Lakeland sketchbook, centred on the black gash of Hell Gill. Looking again at this scene brings back such wonderful memories of my many days out on the fell with Wainwright. Unforgettable memories that lie at the root of my passion for these fells. Day six, and we set our sights on the twin prize of Crickle Crags and Bow Fell. What more thrilling end to our high fell adventure could be imagined? We retrace our path up Oxendale and Brownie Gill to the saddle wherein lies Red Tarn. The hematite, vivid in the soil, leaves no doubt how the tarn gained its name. Look back to the pikes and draw excitement from the striking headland of Great Knot, spelling the start of great things to come on the Crinkly Ridge. There is elation in following the intricate spine of crinkled crags. A fascinating path weaves through rocky knots and knolls, by pools and innumerable surprise views. You'll wish it never to end. A.W. rated crinkled crags and Bowfell as among his top ten fells, and there's no denying the magic of the traverse. Coming by sheltered crags, we pass three tarns and gain a close-up view of the deeply etched southern face of Bow Fell. These gullies are known as the Lynx, with a summit directly above. Weaving on, I begin the final climb, backed by Harrison Stickle. Climbing beside the attractively banded volcanoclastic sandstone rock, the heavily used path made more stable by Fix the Fells. This is Great Slab at the top of Flat Crags, an unusual feature on Bowfell, and from this edge up here you get a marvellous view of the Langdale Pikes. To the left, Cambridge Crags, and ahead, beyond the diagonal scree, Bowfell Buttress, the primary focus of rock climbers' ambition on this fine mountain. And so to the summit itself. Wow! 
I've made it. The summit of Bow Fell. I'm not here alone. There's a multitude of flies. But on a gorgeous day like today, you can't complain. This is the highest point in the old county of Westmoreland and the westernmost point in that county as well. But more important than that, it's the culminating point in our Westmoreland Highway adventure. It's been a wonderful six days and it's a wonderful viewpoint. Turning back down towards the band, I can reflect on six utterly delectable mountain days spent on the Westmoreland Highway. It's been uplifting for me to share this hour with you. Before we started filming, I walked every stride and can attest to the quality of the walking holiday experience that lies in wait. And so now, it's your turn. <laughs>